Welcome to the Putting Your Business on the Map podcast. I'm your podcast host, Landon Blake, a land surveyor living and working in Central California. Happy to have you here. Let's go ahead and dive right into today's episode. The title of today's episode is How Do You Find Good Clients for Your Survey Business? It's a really important question and a question that is hard to answer. I'm going to try and do that today. I'm recording this episode for a friend. He asked if I would talk about this question on the podcast, so I'm going to do that today for him. I hope it helps. As a reminder, I'm working on not using word whiskers, so if you if you hear me pause or hesitate, uh, please be patient. See, I just let one slip there. I let a uh, slip. I'm trying not to say uh, um, like, and you know, which requires that I slow down a little bit and think about what I'm going to say before I say it. So please be patient with me as I work on that. I'll work on being a little better podcast host. I also want to just give you guys a disclaimer here uh, right off the top. And that disclaimer is basically uh, that I don't have a great answer to this question or great answers to this question. I think if I had great answers to this question about how to find good clients, I would probably be working for surveyors, helping them find good clients instead of trying to be a surveyor. So I don't have a silver bullet. Solution to this, I don't have the secret sauce. But I do have some things I would like to share with you on the topic, some things to think about. I will tell you, I hope with an appropriate level of modesty that I think we do a good job of business development and marketing at RH. That's what it really means to find good clients. I think we understand what a good client looks like for our business and we try and attract that that kind of client. It's it's a struggle. It's something that's very hard to do, but I think we, we probably... I want to tell you we do a better job with it than than most surveyors. I think what I can fairly say is we spend more time on it than most survey companies. And I certainly, personally, as as one of the principals, spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I'm a little bit of a a content marketing SEO geek. You know, I I hand-coded my own websites 15 years ago in, in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And so this is, this is the online part of this. I've been involved. Uh, I've been involved in and interested in for a long time, but so I don't, I don't have secret sauce, but I, I've done a lot of work in this area and I've thought about it a lot. So I can hopefully share some things that are, that are useful. But like I said, if, if I had the great answers to this question, I probably would have have more money. <laughs> I'll probably have more money <laughs> and more good clients. So, hang on one sec. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go pause. I'm gonna turn down my phone. I forget to turn down my my phone when I'm recording. So I apologize about that. Uh, well, there's another. Uh, that's so hard. We'll see if we can get through uh, today without more sirens because the last time. Last couple times I recorded, we had sirens. So, all right, I got the disclaimer out of the way. I don't have this all figured out. What are we going to talk about today in the episode? I'm going to give you a story, an opening story about how I got introduced to sales. We're going to talk about what is a good client. We'll find out why it's hard to attract good clients, to to find and attract them. I talked a little bit about that on the first episode. I think it was the first episode about our three biggest challenges, the first three years that we were in business, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. I'm going to tell you there's only one way I know to quickly increase your workload. In other words, the amount of work coming in the door. We'll talk about that. I'll share with you some Things I didn't expect about unexpected clients or why you need to make ripples. That's what my my partner Brian would call it, why you need to make ripples. We'll talk about what are ripples and how you make them. We'll talk a little bit about why it's important to have a good reputation. 
you want to find good clients. And three things, three signs that you're doing a good job of this. So you want to look for these three things in your business. It's a good, they're good signs that you're finding the right clients. And the very last thing is we'll talk about the most important lead generation tool you have. And, and why that is. We'll talk about that. And when I say a, a lead generation tool, I'm talking about, you know, the whole the whole point of marketing is to generate leads. Well, we'll there's other things it does, but that's the most important thing marketing does. So a lead is just a, a potential client. So we're gonna we'll talk about what that most important lead generation tool is just for a few minutes. We'll probably do a whole separate episode on that, but we'll, we'll mention it briefly here now. This is a topic I get excited about. It's very important, and I may not get through everything today. This this outline looks fairly lengthy. This may end up being a couple of episodes, but I'm going to see what we get through. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go more than an hour. I try and keep these to to between thirty and forty five minutes. These episodes, so I may end up breaking this in into two episodes. Okay, so what are we not talking about today? We are not talking about uh, how to retain good clients once you find them, how to get rid of bad clients, the differences between business development and marketing. I was going to do that in this episode. We'll, we'll, we'll do another episode on that. I'm not going to talk about how you control your proposal costs, which is important. We won't talk about content marketing and, and SEO. I'll do it. I'll do a different episode on that. Okay. The other thing I wanted to just let you know right here at the top before we dive into the main part of the episode is. I really think it's important to have your business strategy figured out before you engage in a lot of marketing and business development. So your your sales pipeline, sometimes people call it a funnel, it needs to align well with your with your strategy as a business because if you don't do that, you're going to spend time and money bringing the wrong kind of potential clients into the business and that's frustrating for the potential clients and for you. And it's a waste. So I am going to do an episode that talks a little bit about some of the foundational things I think you need to have figured out before you, you really start to market heavily. And, and we'll talk some more about that. Uh, in the meantime, if you have, if you want, if you're interested, you can go back and listen to the episode I did on strategy. It might have been two episodes. I can't remember. We did one or two episodes on strategy. So you can listen to those. Uh, but I will talk a little bit more about making sure that you're strategy is figured out before you go hog wild on your marketing because I think one needs to come before the other for sure. Your, your strategy determines your value proposition and how you differentiate your business and you need to really know those before you can effectively market. We're not going to talk about that today in detail. All right, so I've got these things we're going to discuss in the episode broken down uh, into seven main points. So just to review those, what is a good client? Why is finding good clients difficult? The only way I know to quickly increase workload. Things I didn't expect about unexpected clients. The importance of a good reputation. Three signs you're, uh, three signs you're doing this at least partially right and your highest ROI lead generation tool. So those are the seven things. We'll try and get to all seven in this episode. So we're going to start with what is a good client. A good client is different for every business. I think understanding that is one of the most important things you can do as a business owner. Especially as a, as a survey business or any other kind of professional consultant. You know, you're not, it's not like, it's important in any business, but we, we need to discriminate even even more than a, a, a business that serves primarily consumers like a, like a Taco Bell or Amazon. Uh, we need to discriminate. Even those businesses need to discriminate. When, and when I say discriminate, that word has gotten a negative connotation in our modern society, but it, it used to not have a negative con con connotation. When I, when I say discriminate in that context, what I mean is serve the right type of client and don't serve the wrong type of client. So, you know, a good client 
for your business is probably going to look different than a good client for RH. So for example, a lot of small survey companies do what we call lot surveys or fence surveys. We don't do those here, or rarely. We rarely do them. People in that market just tend not to be a good client for us. They just Their needs don't align well with our value proposition. So a good client for your business might be different than a good client for a, a, another survey business, the survey business down the street. And so you need to, you need to understand that. You know, I, I would say, well, I joke sometimes that Oakdale, California, where we have our, our headquarters, uh, has more surveyors per capita than any other town in the nation. There's like, I don't know, a half a dozen surveyors here, and it's a really small town. <laughs> That's because it's a, it's a small town in, in, in the kind of farming area of Central California, and it, it attracts, it tends to attract surveyors uh, because we like the country and we like small towns, a lot of us. Um, and so, you know, we, RH is very different from, you know, I got two surveyors that are within a, within a couple blocks of where I'm sitting. We're very different from those other survey companies and we serve a different type of client. Okay. So having said that, having, having said that a good client is going to be different for each business or, or. It's not that your good client will be unique, but different types of survey businesses will have different types of good clients. There are some hallmarks of a good client. So things you look for in a client that are that are going to make them a good client, no matter what kind of survey business you have. I'm sorry, five. I have five. Five hallmarks of a good client. So I want to I want to give those to you. Now, before I give you this list, you have to understand. I'm talking to surveyors that sell expert consulting services and not low bid work products. If you sell low bid work products or low value services, this isn't going to apply to you, right? So in other words, if you're if the only reason your client is selecting you as a surveyor is because you're low bid, then this list doesn't apply to you. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I hope the people I'm trying to reach with this podcast are surveyors like me that, that want to do things differently. They, they don't just want to be another low bid provider. Okay. So if you want to be a surveyor that really helps people with good advice, then here's what you look for in a client. Five things. Number one, they recognize you're an expert. I'm going to talk about this in a marketing video on the YouTube channel, but you know, I don't know, a couple times a month, I visit with a potential client that thinks they already know everything they need to know about real estate and land development. And what I usually tell those clients is, I don't think you should hire me if you already have all the answers. And what they usually say is like, well, yeah, but I need X. And I'm like, I understand, but you can find, if you think you already know how to do everything, you can find X from somebody that's cheaper than me. Like I really look to help people that recognize they need my expertise in some part of their project. So I don't work for people that already think they're the expert or think they can figure everything out without me. You know, if you think you can watch a couple YouTube videos and read an article on Wikipedia and be an expert land developer in California, you're probably not my client. So that's the first hallmark. They recognize that, that, that you're an expert, not an expert in everything, but in an expert in your areas of, of competence. Number two, second hallmark, they listen carefully to your advice. Uh, I have a, a video on our marketing channel that says the title something like, don't hire me and then ask me to lie to you. You know, part of the value in a good consultant is they're going to tell you the truth, even if it's not what you want to hear. Number three, they value your time talk about that in the episode on the worst client we had the first few years we were in business. So you need, you need a client that values your time. Number four, you need a client that pays your bills on time. I can't emphasize as a small business how important that is. Clients underestimate how important it is. That's one of the, one of the most important things we look for in a client is do they pay their bills on time? And then the last thing, number five is do they make a reasonable ass? 
I'm going to do a video on our, our marketing channel that talks a little bit about what is a reasonable ask and what is an unreasonable ask. You don't you don't want to work for clients that regularly make unreasonable asks. You, you know, you want to work with clients that are reasonable. So for the purposes of our discussion in this episode and in the, in the future episodes we do about finding good clients, that's to me is a good client. And that's what we're talking about. We need a definition. So that's the definition I'm, I'm using. Number one, they recognize you as an expert. Number two, they listen carefully to your advice. Number three, they value your time. Number four, they pay your bills promptly. Number five, they only make reasonable asks. All right, so now that we know what that client looks like, why is finding good clients difficult? I talk about that a little bit in the episode. The, I think it's the very first episode we do about the three biggest challenges of our first three years in business, but I'm going to expound on it a little bit. So I have six ways, excuse me, six reasons why it's difficult to find good clients. Okay? The first one is uh, most people. Now I'm going to, I'm going to talk about people here, but the same thing could apply to organizations because you're really dealing with people inside of an organization. So most people aren't good clients. I think part of the reason is you need to be a good person to be a good client. And there's a lot of people that aren't good people. Like I try, you know, I commute with those people. They're the same people that cut you off and drive 50 miles over the speed limit and, you know, run people off the road. So I think it's hard to find good clients because it's hard to be a good person in today's world. And if you're going to be a good client, you're going to be a good person. So there's just, there's just not a lot of good clients out there. I just, I think that's just part of human society today. So you're, you're looking for a small proportion of the overall human population that needs your services and is, and, and are good human beings. And that, that Venn, the intersection of those two circles, you know, that Venn diagram, that, that intersection is fairly small. Uh, second reason why I think it's hard to find good clients is just most people are dominated by short-term thinking. That's just human nature. We all suffer from it. We have to work really hard to fight that impulse or that tendency. It's something I have to fight all the time as a business owner. You know, mo most people are thinking about the dollar they're going to save today and not the $5 it's going to cost them in a year or in 10 years. And it's really, it's really hard to fight that tendency as human beings. And the client that understands they might need to spend a little more money up front to save money in the long run, that is a rare kind of client. And so it's hard to find those folks. Number three, people don't understand what land surveyors do or how we help them. We can't blame them for that. First of all, what we do is complex and technical. And number two, we don't do a good job educating people about it. That's one of the reasons why we have the YouTube channels that we do because we want we want people to understand what surveyors do and how we help them. But most people don't, and so if they that means they they don't understand what they're trying to buy. Right? Number four, uh, we as a profession have allowed bad behavior by our clients for a long, long time, and so they they become accustomed to just bad behavior. Uh, one of the main reasons I started RH, and one of the things I enjoy about being an owner is. I don't have to tolerate bad behavior from clients anymore. If you're a bad client, we will fire you. And we're not embarrassed about that. And I tell people all the time, I don't want to work for everybody. I don't want every client. Uh, I only want good clients. <laughs> so I think as a profession, we've done a really bad job of, of setting reasonable expectations for, from our, for our clients. And I think this is especially true with civil engineers. So for a long time... Surveyors have kind of been the redheaded stepchild in civil engineering companies, and we've just allowed the civil engineers that own those companies to push us around, and that has just created bad behavior. And I still deal with that even as an independent survey company. I have civil engineers call and just expect ridiculous stuff, like for me to rubber stamp their mapping work products for you know five hundred dollars a pop, just crazy stuff. So we've allowed that as a profession. We've allowed that behavior. Number five. I think the internet has taught a lot of people that advice should be free and that coupon deals should be available for every product and service. And don't get me wrong, I know I sound like an old fogey there. I think the internet is a wonderful thing that it has changed my life for the better and I think it's improved 
the balance of power between businesses and consumers in a really healthy, positive way. But it's not all positive. So the internet has taught people, you know, that all advice should be free, and that's not true. Sometimes you need to pay for good advice. And it's taught people, you know, like my wife, who I love and adore, that she should just be able to get a coupon deal on everything. And I don't think that should be true. Sometimes getting a coupon deal is a bad idea. So we, I think we fight that a little bit. We, we fight those trends that the internet has taught people. And the, the last reason it's hard, um, and, I, and I talk about this again in that first episode, is other land surveyors will cut corners, break the law, and work for starvation wages. I want to do a whole different episode on why surveyors will work for starvation wages. I don't blame them. There's reasons why they do it that I understand, but it, it does make it hard to run a reasonably profitable surveying business. There, there are, I have friends in the serving profession that, you know, probably work for $25 an hour, which is not a lot of money here in California to be a licensed surveyor. So for all those reasons, it's hard. It's hard to find good clients. This is a huge challenge that we have. And I, I you know, we haven't figured it out. We, we have certainly haven't got that all figured out. All right. So that brings me to the, to the third point, number three, third point of the episode. Give me one sec. And I, when I, and I thought about this, I hadn't consciously thought about this really until I sat down to outline this episode. But I, want, I think it's important, so I wanted to talk to you guys about it. There's only one way I know to quickly increase your workload. That is, you know, if you're running out of work and you need to get work in the door in, in, in a week or two or three, there's only one way I know how to do that. And it's to cut prices. If you do that, you will get work more than likely. That is the worst way to find good clients. So I just want to be super clear about that. It, it, that will bring you clients, but it won't typically bring you good clients. Now, I'm not saying you don't ever do that as a business owner. Sometimes that, that might be necessary. You know, if you've overextended yourself, you got you you got a little too much debt, or you know you you've got a big project that stalls for some reason. You you may need to get some work in the door. You can do that by dropping your prices, and it, and it usually works. It works quickly. It does, but just understand the consequences of that. Remember now that reason that works. It works really good. The reason it works is because most people shop for surveys based on low price. So if you can be the low price, people will hire you. But you know, remember, those people are buying a product. They're not, they're not buying a professional service or looking for your good advice. And they are not probably going to be a good client. I have certainly noticed that the people that shop for surveys on low bid are also the most likely to not pay my bill. And I, I think other surveyors will probably tell you that's true. Now, there are, there are other things you can do. So you can shake the tree, you know, beat the street, you know, do, do more marketing. Uh, but even, even when you do that, and I do that sometimes, you know, when, when things get a little slow, especially as we move into the winter months here in our part of California, you know, I'll, I'll spend more time on marketing and business development. But even, you know, even if you're doing that, if you step up that pace of activity, it still seems to take time to find and engage with good clients. Like, you know, best case scenarios usually it's a couple months before somebody finds you, figures out what you do, tells you about their project, you get a contract executed, you get all the ducks lined up in a row. You know, it just you can't. It's hard to just do that stuff in a week. You know, I would also tell you now we do work sometimes for people that come to us at the last minute. I find those people typically crisis manage a lot of other stuff. And that tends to mean they are a pain as a client. I'm not saying, you know, now we make good money working for people that wait till the last minute. You just have to understand what you're, what you're getting. You know, you're getting somebody that probably crisis manages and they're going to crisis manage your relationship too. So what, what I, what I've told my people when we, when we talk about marketing and business development here is finding good clients is a long-term process. It's like I, I use an illustration. It's not mine. I, I can't remember where I heard this, but. I think it was in a book, but mar marketing is like planting an orchard, not a vegetable garden. 
In other words, to really bear good fruit, it takes years, right? It's not, it's not, you don't plant and reap the rewards in one season. So if you need work immediately, the only way I know how to do that is to cut your fees. So if you're listening to this episode, hoping that you're going to find out how to get work in the door next week, I, I, none, nothing we're going to talk about for the rest of the episode is going to help you do that. Cut your prices. That's the only solution I have to that short-term or immediate problem. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Number four is things I didn't expect about unexpected clients. So you can kind of subtitle that, why you need to make ripples. That's what my partner Brian Leiser would say, why you need to make ripples. I think I talked about a little bit about this in the first episode. Almost all of the good clients we have at RH have come from, un- they've either come from unexpected places or they've been unexpected clients, which surprised me. What A part of what that goes to show is I'm not as smart as I think I am because I am not working for the people I thought when I started the business. <laughs> so when I say that, and, and, and we don't have a, we don't have a ton of great clients. We have a handful so where, where, you know, when I say they've come from unexpected places, what, what, do, what do I mean? Uh, one of those clients came from a phone call with a recruiter. One came from a lunch meeting with a client after the first project we did with them. One, one of our great clients came from a bad client. They have not come from, from the places I have expected. And uh, the clients, we, the type of clients we work for aren't what I expected. So that's why that's why I titled this section things I didn't expect about unexpected clients. So when I started the business, I really thought I was going to be working for civil engineers and real estate agents. We don't work for any civil engineers or real estate agents. So who do we work for? We work for utility companies, we work for land attorneys, we work for large institutional landowners. Now, that doesn't mean that that Civil engineers and real estate agents might not be great for your business. I the point I'm trying to make is if you're if you're starting out, you you may not be working for who you thought you were going to be working for, and that's okay. You know the the markets the 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 market the free market the the economy is trying to tell you something there, right? So one of the things that's taught me is I need to be adaptable, right? The the people that need your expert advice and your course core competencies, you know, your core skills may not always be who you think, and that's okay. Those people, those other types of clients still need your help. So one thing it taught me is be adaptable. And the other thing it taught me is uh, get good at hard stuff that other surveyors don't like to do. You know, we do CEQA, we do land use planning, we will manage utility locating, we we do large scale control networks and, and land nets. A lot of surveyors don't, you know, we map deeded parcels, we do riparian boundaries. A lot of surveyors don't like that stuff because it's hard, right? So be adaptable, get good at, at stuff other surveyors don't like to do. If there's, if there was only two things you take away from this episode on how to find good clients, let it be those two things. Be adaptable, get good at, at hard stuff other surveyors don't like to do. You know, we get paid all the time to do hard stuff that other surveyors don't like. Uh, my partner, Danny, is managing a job right now. It's super gnarly terrain. It's the hardest physical work I've ever done as a land surveyor. Uh, it's challenging. Logistically, the, the boundary surveying is, is challenging. And the client has been super grateful that they have us because they couldn't find other surveyors to do the work. So remember those two things. And then, you know, I'd, I'd like to do, we'll do a PYBOTM extra on, on ripples, you know. I'll give you some examples of, of what, I, what I mean, what my partner Brian means when he says make ripples, but learn to make ripples. You don't, you just don't know where your next client's going to be found. I, my good clients, I always find them in places I don't expect. So throwing, you know, throwing small stones into the lake can make a big difference. You know, that, that ripple bumps into somebody that bumps into somebody that bumps into somebody else. And then before you know it, you have a good client, maybe for life. So I've learned, you know, some of this is, I don't want to call it random chance because that makes it sound like it's an accident, but some of it's just 
doing stuff. You know, just doing stuff. You know, getting off of your couch and just getting out into the world and doing stuff you love. You know, and survey survey related stuff that you love. And you're going to bump into like-minded people. And some of those people are going to be your clients or going to know other people that, that want to be your clients. So learn to make ripples. We'll talk more about that. I have become, with, with some encouragement from my partner Brian, I've become much more open-minded about the type of, of stuff, the type of activity that results in, in leads on, on good clients. See, there's my siren. I knew we were going to get at least one. Okay, number five is uh, the importance of having a good reputation to finding good clients. Uh, the internet is a two-edged sword, I think, in this regard. So it's really changed the way people find and, and hire consultants. It's changed the way I find and hire people. Um, so you don't you don't necessarily need to have a, as good of a local reputation as you used to. You know, it used to be you worked in one town or maybe a couple towns or one county if you were a surveyor. And if you got a better reputation in that town, you know, it was really hard to overcome that. You basically had to move. The Internet now has allowed us to work all over, so it's greatly expanded the footprint of most survey businesses. So if you screw up your local reputation in town, that's not as big of a deal anymore. But you, you got to have a great online reputation, and it's easier now for people to leave reviews and to rate you. Um, and so, I don't know, it's a two-edged sword there. I think it's easier than ever before to be found because of the internet. And so what that does is it rewards smart players that understand their value proposition and how to differentiate. Uh, so for example, I've been thinking a lot about how we help people kind of with, with full circle land development. I, I'm, I'm, I think I think I'm going to call it compendious, compendious land development. In other words, they help the client walk through the whole land development process from... Uh, from concept to finished construction. It's almost like a project management role. And that's typically done, you know, architects typically fill that role. Sometimes the civil engineers do, but they just, they aren't doing a good job of it. A lot of times I find they don't want to, they don't want to be bothered with it. So we find, especially on our small to mid-sized projects that clients have a need for that service. And so that's, that's something I've thought about. See that that's a way for, for my company to differentiate from the surveyor that's just going to do your boundary topo and then and then walk away and never call you again. So I think you you, you should consider that. You know, the internet allows firms that understand how to offer value and differentiate the the opportunity to engage with clients all over. You know, one thing that makes our business at RH I think a really different from from their traditional small survey firm is we work for clients all over. I mean, not just all over California and Nevada, but my, my partner Brian works all over the Western United States. Those people hire us because we're experts at the problems they're trying to solve, not because we are just happen to be the survey shop around the corner from, from them. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The other reason a, a good reputation is important, I think, is because uh, tip, typically, the best clients that you get come from referrals from existing clients or business partners. And I told you we've had some some good clients come from unexpected sources, but we you know we've had a couple good clients that just come from from getting referrals. And so, uh, having a good reputation is important to get to get good referrals. Now, I just want to I just want to drive dive down on that a little bit, or or or, or drive into it a little bit. So having a good reputation to generate referrals doesn't mean being a pushover and letting your clients take advantage of you. That's not good. That's not good or healthy. What it does mean is being honest and being fair. So you always need to be honest and fair. And then when you can, be generous. And that's what I tell my partners. We're always honest and fair. We look for opportunities to be generous when we can. Understand win-win opportunities. You know, that's my biggest disappointment with people in the marketplace is they just, everybody's playing a zero-sum game, you know, they think if they think if you're benefiting somehow from a transaction that they're they're getting screwed, and that's just not true. There are win-win opportunities out there, but very few people know how to look for those anymore, and that's disappointing. I think if you can be the type of consultant and business partner that understands win-win opportunities, uh, that that's a huge advantage. And then finally, be reasonable in your ass. Yeah, we talked about that. 
you want your clients to be reasonable in their ass, but you know, as a consultant, you need to be reasonable in your ass, right? So don't don't ask your your client to do unreasonable things. So have that you know that's part of having a good reputation. It doesn't mean being a pushover or, or giving a client a bunch of free stuff. And you might sometimes give good clients free stuff, but that's that's not what having a good reputation is about. It's about being honest and fair and generous when you can be. There's another siren. Sorry, guys. Okay, number six. I think we're going to get through everything here. Number six. I want to give you four signs that you're already doing a good job of this. A good job of what? Finding good clients. So, now, I know most of you that are listening are probably thinking, well, I know I'm not doing a good job because I don't have enough good, I don't have enough good clients. I, that's just a struggle. That doesn't mean you're not doing a good job. I just think, I think we might always feel that way. No matter how many good clients we have, we, we probably will feel like we could have more because they're hard to find. So here's a here's some signs, four, four signs that you might already be doing a good job. Number one, you're getting referrals. And if you're getting one or two referrals a month, that's a good sign, right? It, 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 that, you're, that you're doing a good job with the clients you have, that you're getting your message out. Number two, if you're getting the right type of leads. So if you're, if you're getting opportunities to talk to people about being their consultant, you know, a couple, to- two, three, four times a month, even if, even if those conversations don't turn into jobs, those leads are a positive sign. That means you're doing some marketing, right? So that's good. Uh, number three, if, if people, when they engage with you for the first time, already feel like they know you at some level, that's excellent. That means that means you're doing a good job of your marketing. That's something I've just come started to, to appreciate, come to understand in the last year or two is, you know, I put a lot of time in the YouTube channel. That wasn't necessarily part of the master plan. It, it happened because... I spent too much time on the keyboard and recording the, the videos, the marketing videos was something I could do that didn't involve being on the keyboard. But one of the things I've realized kind of accidentally about our YouTube channel is it really gives people an opportunity to get to know me before they call me or email me for the first time. So I, it cracks me up. I get on the phone with people or I get an email from people and they treat me like I'm a, I've been their friend for years. And some of those people have been listening to me on YouTube for years now. And so that's a that's a really positive sign. So if people call and they kind of there's already they see what you've done there is you've already established some level of trust, and that's fantastic. So if people call and they and they kind of talk to you like they already know you. That's great. You're doing a good job of your marketing. And then number four, if people when they engage with you for the first time by email or web form or phone call, text message, if they already have a rough idea of how you can help them, that's also a good sign. That means. You've, get, got, you've gotten your message out. They maybe understand something about your value proposition and how you're different from your competitors. And so that's fantastic. Now, they don't have to have an exact idea of how you can help them because a lot of times you need to walk people through that process, ask them the right questions, understand their goals. But if they have a rough idea of why they're calling you to begin with, that's a good sign. So all four of those good signs that you're already doing a good job of this, of, of finding good clients. Okay, to wrap up here, I want to talk about what I think your highest ROI lead generation tool is. So when I say ROI, that's return on investment. Lead generation means creating... I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. Motivating people to take action to contact you about potentially being a client. That, so that's a lead. So what is the most powerful lead generation tool that you have? It is your company website. So most of our leads at our age, I would say 90% come from our website. We get work from our website every month. And I, like, I, I can't, it's hard for me to emphasize how important that is. Like $25,000, $50,000, $15,000, $30,000. Like that website brings in a job like that every month almost without fail and i've learned now i'm active on social media i participate in professional associations nothing i do has the impact that our website does period full stop so the time that you spend on your website pays off exponentially i guarantee you you are not spending enough time on your website we have a pretty good website i'm I'm 
fairly proud of it. I don't spend enough time on the website. I need to spend less time doing this podcast and more time on the company website. Building a great website is hard, like most things that pay off. It takes time and it, and it takes effort, but it's worth it. And, and I'll just add here, you don't have to get professional help to do that, but you probably need it. Um, I Now, I I had background as a, as a web designer and web developer before I started RH, so I had a little bit of a head start there. We use WordPress. I, I, run all, I run all of our websites on WordPress. I know how to do that. WordPress is not, you can learn how to use WordPress. It's not a huge effort. It does take some time. Uh, but you might need professional writing help, editing help, you know, video, video creation help. I'm fairly comfortable with a lot of that stuff, but it's taken me a long time. It's taken years. And you may not want to make that investment. So it, you should think about professional help potentially with your website. So just remember now, I, like, why? Why is your website so important? It's not rocket science. You shop on the internet too, right? What's the first thing you do when you hear about a company or a product? Google search, right? A web search, almost certainly, whether it's on your phone or the desktop or your tablet. That's what your potential clients are doing. That's why your website's so important. We're going to do a whole separate episode about your company website and what needs to be on it. All right, so in conclusion, I just want to tell you a, a story, a short story. Many of you know I'm, I'm, I've been married for 20 years. My wife drives me crazy. She's she's a little firecracker Latina. She drives she you know she's a little short firecracker Latina. She drives me a little bonkers, but I love I love and adore her. She has her own car. She's pretty, she's independent. She has you know her own job, her own money, her own bank account, her own car. You know she's she had her own career. She's absolutely a professional modern woman. And I'm okay with that. I'm secure with that. It doesn't bother me. So she likes to take care of her own car when her car needs service. She she takes care of that. And I don't work on cars because modern cars are hugely complex and I am not a great mechanic and I would mess our cars up. So she, we needed to find my wife a mechanic. Now for a long time, I took my, my trucks to the dealer. I Now I go to my wife's mechanic, but I, I for a long time... Just took my truck to the dealer. My wife, who is a coupon shopper, did not want to take her car to the dealer because <laughs> dealers are expensive, which I understand. So we had to find her a mechanic. And and so now she asked for my help with that. And a lot of people know that there are mechanics that will take advantage of women. So my wife said, you know, I need your help finding a good mechanic. And we did. We found a fantastic mechanic. It's it's uh, Precision Automotive in Manteca. I am not being paid for this promotion. But they're just... The mechanic there, his name's Ted. He is just an amazing guy. He's he's super honest. I think that's... You know, he's deeply religious. There's not always a connection there. One doesn't always cause the other. But I know I can tell Ted's deeply religious. He is one of the most honest people I've ever met in my life. They do great work. I mean, they do fantastic work. They gr- provide great service. And you know what I love about Ted and his shop there, at Precision Automotive? I send my wife down there. If she calls me and says Ted said I needed a a, a fluid change in my transmission, I tell her to do it. And you don't question what Ted tells my wife. He takes good care of her car, and he takes good care of her, and I trust him. He, you know, I've been and we've been going there for years now. He, they do such an awesome job that I stopped taking my work truck to the mechanic. Now I take it to Ted for everything, except for the oil change. They got a good jiffy loop here in town I take my truck to for an oil change. But everything else, it goes to Ted. It goes to Ted or Oakdale Garage here in town. It's another good mechanic. The point is, I was so grateful to find a mechanic that I could that my wife could go to. I don't have to micromanage it. I know I can trust him. He's going to treat her good. He's not going to cheat her. We never price shop him. Now, could my wife find somebody to do her next vehicle service for 20% cheaper than Ted? Yeah, absolutely she could. That's not important to us. Ted provides good value. He's not the cheapest, but he's not as expensive as the dealer, the Toyota dealer. He provides good value, great service. I trust him with my wife and her car. I will be his client we will be Ted's clients for life. When Ted retires, 
I don't know what we're going to do. I'm going to have to go find another good mechanic. Like, I am going to beg Ted not to retire. That's who you want to be as a land surveyor. You want to be Ted at Precision Automotive. Right? You have to be the cheapest. Remember what we talked about? Be honest. Be fair. When you can afford it and you have the opportunity to be generous. That's I think that's the secret to finding good clients. So just to review what we talked about today. Number one, we talked about what is a good client. Number two, we talked about why finding good clients is difficult. Number three, we talked about the only way I know to quickly increase your workload, cut your price. Number four, we talked about the things I didn't expect about unexpected clients or, as Brian Leiser would say, why you need to make ripples. Number five, we talked about why good reputation is important if you want to find good clients. Number six, we talked about four signs that you're doing this at least partially right. And then the last one, number seven, we talked for a little, just a few minutes about why a good website is so important. So we're, we're going to talk a lot more about this because it's a, it's a subject I get passionate about. As you can tell, I geek out on, on marketing and business development. And so I get excited about it. So we'll, we'll talk about it some more. Uh, so future episodes I, I've got on this topic. Uh, so we're just going to do this a series called Finding Good Clients. So do you have to feel sleazy when you sell? A lot of, a lot of surveyors feel that way. You don't. You don't have to feel sleazy when you sell. So I'm going to try and help you with that. We'll talk about the differences between business development and marketing. I think I'm going to do that one next. That'll be the next episode in this series. We'll talk about getting the foundation right before you go crazy on your marketing, you know, understanding your value proposition and your and how you differentiate. Okay, but the next episode, we're going to take a little break from, from this series on finding good clients. I'm going to talk about leading from the front or should your land surveyor be in the field. Uh, that came up in a, in a post on LinkedIn that, that one of my business partners made and we got some people upset. And so usually when I see people getting upset that I realize, oh, hey, that's something that's a that's a good topic for the podcast. So we're going to talk about kind of the leadership style that we try and follow here at RH. Both my partners are super supportive of that and engaged with it and have helped shape that leadership style. And I think it is somewhat unique for survey companies. It's, it's not completely I shouldn't say unique. It's special. I don't, there are other companies that do, that do it like us, but I don't think there's a lot. Um, and so I want to answer that question, you know, should your senior land surveyor be in the field? All of the principals here at RH regularly spend time in the field. Yeah, there's trade-offs there, so we'll talk about what are some of the trade-offs. But we'll also talk about why I think it's really important. We'll talk a little bit about Alan, Alexander the Great. We're going to talk about Paul the Butcher, Doug the Heavy Equipment Operator, and, uh, and Randy the engineer, talk about all three of those guys and, and what they taught me about being a good leader and leading from the front. So I look forward to that. Being a good leader is hard. So we'll cover that in the next episode. I believe that's episode number 19. So I can't believe we're already up to 19. That's crazy. Uh, pretty soon we'll have a year's worth. So hope you guys uh, are enjoying the podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I forgot, I totally forgot to count my word. I just, I got excited and for, totally forgot to count my word whiskers. I'll have to go back and listen to this and count my word whiskers. Be patient with me. I'll get better with my word whiskers. Thank you for listening today. Appreciate it. And I salute all of you that are trying to run honest surveying businesses. I know that's that's difficult. And I also, I had a couple more people reach out to me with, with, with thank you notes. Some land surveyors. I appreciate that. It makes me feel really good. It makes me feel like this, this message resonates and, and that it matters to you guys. So I appreciate that. We'll catch you on the next episode. As we wrap up the podcast today, I want to do a couple things. I want to let you guys know where you can find the podcast. And I also want to let you know how you can support the podcast if you've enjoyed it. So let's start with that first thing. Where can you find the podcast? The podcast lives on the web at landonblake.com slash P-Y-B-O-T-M. So if you go to my website, landonblake.com, up at the top, you'll find a menu. Go to learn. It's the second link in the Learn menu. That'll take you right to the podcast. We have got links to download all the episodes there in MP3 format, and we also have the show notes. You can also find the podcast on YouTube, youtube.com at slash at P-Y-B-O-T-M. All of the episodes are also uploaded there. We have the podcast on Spotify. So you can find the podcast in all of those places. Second thing, how can you support the podcast? There's a few different ways you can do that. 
If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, reach out to me with an email, phone call, or text message. We can talk about your job opportunity for senior land surveyors, or if you have a high quality product or service for land surveyors and mappers, we could also talk about that on the podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast on YouTube or Spotify. Tell a friend about the podcast. Share one of your favorite episodes on social media for us. And then finally, if you'd like to make a real difference, you can go to the On Point Workshops page at Patreon. We've got a tier there, membership tier for $20 a month. You can join and support the podcast and you get extras. We call them PYBOTM extras there. Uh, So we try and do one or two extras from each episode, a video and audio. Uh, as just a little thank you to the the folks that support us for twenty dollars a month so if you got the price of a medium pizza in your budget and you want to support the podcast the best way to do that is on patreon that will help me pay for carly carly is the virtual assistant and digital marketing extraordinaire that helps me with all of the unseen back-end work on the podcast so editing maintaining the web page doing the show notes that kind of stuff carly's great i'd like to keep her around One way you can help me do that is by becoming a subscriber or a member on Patreon. So appreciate everybody that's done that already. And I also appreciate the thank you notes I've I've gotten from several of you for the podcast. That that makes a difference. I know everybody's busy. I appreciate you guys taking some time out of your busy schedule to send a thank you note. Uh, So please support the podcast. And we will catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.